Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Christina Rosinski, and I'm joined today uh, by my colleague Sarah Catherine Williams, and we're from Child Trends. And we're an organization in the DC area whose mission is to improve the lives and prospects of children and youth by conducting high quality research and then sharing the resulting knowledge with practitioners and policymakers. And today we're pleased to share with you the findings of our latest survey on child welfare agency financing. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a few kind of logistical pointers. Uh, if you're having trouble hearing the webinar and are participating with your computer's audio, uh, we find that it's helpful if you switch your audio options from computer audio to phone call. Sometimes that can provide a better connection. Uh, when joining by a phone call option, and after dialing your phone number and access code, make sure that to dial your audio PIN, which is, uh, you can see on your that side box, uh, an example is pound 100 pound. Uh, if you have any technical problems during today's webinar or have any questions, you can use the questions box uh, in the, the box on the right of your screen. Um, after our presentation today, we will have plenty of time for questions. And at any point during the webinar, you can feel free to use that questions box to type in your question. And then once we get to the end of the presentation, we'll read out the questions that have been submitted and answer them um, given you know, the amount of time we have remaining. If we're unable to get to all of the questions, we can follow up with you after today's webinar. Um, I should note that we are trying to record today's <laughs> webinar. We were a couple minutes late in getting started due to some technical difficulties. Um, it's possible that the recording is not working, um, but the goal was to record today's webinar. Um, if it turns out that the recording is going on right now and is successful, we will post it on our website after today's webinar. So as for an agenda for today's call, uh, we will first start off with an overview of the Child Welfare Financing Survey, just provide some background about what that survey is. Uh, we'll go through the key findings from that survey. Uh, we'll also provide a quick tour of the products that we have related to this survey that are available on the Child Trends website. And then, like I just mentioned, we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So, as for an overview of the survey, uh, the Trouble for Financing survey is supported by the Annie E. Casey Foundation and Casey Family Programs and is conducted by us here at Child Trends. This is the 10th iteration, the state fiscal year 2016 survey is the 10th iteration of the survey since 1996. And the goal of the survey is to document the sources and amounts of spending by child welfare agencies across the country. And data collected through this survey allows for documentation of national and state specific trends, as well as comparisons across states. Uh, this year, for the state fiscal year 2016 survey, 50 states, including D.C., participated. Unfortunately, Puerto Rico and Vermont were unable to participate this year. Uh, but when possible, we incorporated data from Puerto Rico and Vermont that they provide to the Department of Health and Human Services at the federal level. Uh, this allowed for some inclusion of data um, from some funding sources, but not all. Um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind. Uh, another thing is that uh, for those who are familiar with the survey that we conduct, since we do it every other year, this year's survey is very similar. The questions that were asked on the survey were very similar to questions in prior surveys, but we did add several new questions this year. Um, so for example, you know, we, we adapt the tool each year to kind of keep up with what's of interest to the field. So for example, this year we added some, some questions around uh, prevention services that child welfare agencies fund. We added some questions around spending on family foster care versus congregate care. So you're not just asking about all out-of-home placements together, but breaking that out a bit more. Uh, we asked some questions about spending on evidence-based practices and spending on transportation to maintain school stability and, and several other new questions, um, some of which we'll touch on today. Uh, just a little bit more background before we dive into the findings. Uh, the survey collects data on states' expenditures on child welfare activities for state fiscal year 2016. And by expenditures, we mean all state fiscal year expenditures for the programs, case management, administration, 
and operation of a state's child welfare services system. Um, and this is an important distinction from appropriated funds. So we're really focused on the actual expenditures, not any amounts that were appropriated and may not have been spent, for example. And by child welfare, we're referring to all of the uh, services and activities you can see here on the screen that are administered by the child welfare agency for children, young adults, and families. And so this includes services for intact families to prevent child abuse and neglect, foster care placement or reentry, child protective services, out of home placements, adoption and guardianship services, and services and assistance for older youth as well. So in a nutshell, the survey captures child welfare agency expenditures on child welfare services. So now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Sarah Catherine, uh, who will uh, provide a quick summary of our main key findings, and then we'll dive into each one. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Christina. Um, so again, uh, I'm just going to run through um, our nine key takeaways, uh, and then uh, Christina and I will pass it back and forth um, to talk about each one of these in more detail. So uh, the first uh, key finding is that uh, total child welfare agency expenditures increased 5% uh, state fiscal year 2014, uh, and de but decreased over the past decade. Expenditures from some federal funding streams decreased substantially over the past decade. Child welfare agency spending continues to be predominantly financed by state and local sources. States vary greatly in terms of child welfare agency expenditures. Uh, Title IV-E waiver expenditures increased since uh, state fiscal year 2014, and for brevity, I will drop the state fiscal year <laughs> from now on. So um, since uh, 2014, those waiver expenditures have increased. Um, about half of federal and state and local expenditures by child welfare agencies involve out-of-home placement. State and local sources finance slightly more than half of spending on family foster care and congregate care. Fewer child welfare agencies focus prevention spending on substance abuse and mental health services than other preventive services. And our last key finding is that uh, few states were able to report information about spending on evidence-based practices or on transportation for school stability. So I'm going to hand it to Christina to start mm -hmm. talking about the first finding in more depth. Great. So key finding number one is the total child welfare agency expenditures increased 5% since 2014, but decreased over the decades. And so as you can see here, child welfare agency ex uh, agencies reported spending $29.9 billion in federal, state, and local funds on child welfare services in 2016. And this represented a 5% increase over 2014. And among states with comparable data in 2006, and in 2016, so over the decade, total child welfare agency expenditures have decreased by 1% over that time period. And you can see here on this slide, the graph uh, shows the trend line over the past decade. Now, one thing I'll flag here is that the figures presented in the graph reflect an analysis of 29 states with comparable data across all six years that are reflected in the graph. So that's why the 2016 amount in the graph, 20.9 billion, differs from the total reported for 2016, 29.9 billion. And you know, while that's the overall kind of national picture, there is quite a bit of state variation. So despite this overall 5% increase in child welfare agency spending between 2014 and 2016, states varied widely in the magnitude and the direction of changes in their spending. Of the 43 states that had sufficient data in both 2014 and 2016, 30 of those states reported an increase in total expenditures, while 13 reported a decrease in total expenditures. And these increases ranged from you know, tiny, less than 1% increases to 42% increases in one state, and decreases ranged, ranged from a less than 1% decrease to a 25% decrease in one state. And there are many potential explanations for this overall trend that we see at the national level. One explanation has to do with changes in the child welfare population. So over the past decade, the number of children in care has decreased by 14%, even though there's been an increase in you know, some more recent years. 
And this decrease over the decade 2006 to 2016 aligns well with the finding that total child welfare agency expenditures have decreased over that same time period. But of course, we know the story is often more complex. Because beyond serving children in care, child welfare agencies handle referrals for maltreatment, they provide preventive services, and, and do much more. And in fact, the maltreatment referral rate has increased over the decade, which does not align with the decrease in spending. Also, the number of children receiving adoption and guardianship assistance, the number of substantiated cases of maltreatment, service costs, you know, the needs of the child welfare population, child welfare practice changes, all of those affect spending year to year as well, regardless of changes in the number of children in care. So while the changes in the number of children in care may affect expenditures, it's not the only explanation. Other explanations relate to how expenditures of particular funding streams have changed over time, which we'll show on the next slide. And this is a key finding number two, which is expenditures from some federal funding streams decreased substantially over the past decade. And before we get into the trends here, I'll first provide a brief overview of these funding streams. First uh, listed here is Title IV-B of the Social Security Act, which is a funding source that's specific to child welfare, and it can be used for the prevention of maltreatment, family preservation, family reunification, services for foster and adopted children, training for child welfare professionals, and adoption promotion activities. There's also Medicaid, which provides health coverage and services, including clinical behavioral health services to low-income individuals. Um, one thing to keep in mind about Medicaid is that on our survey, states only report Medicaid dollars that cover costs borne by the child welfare agency or uh, for which the child welfare agency pay the non-federal match. It excludes Medicaid funded costs for the child welfare population that were borne by other agencies like health departments. So that means it excludes costs associated with health care coverage. There's also Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, or TANF, which addresses four overarching purposes, which are defined in statute as providing assistance to needy families so that children may be cared for in their own homes or in the homes of relatives. TANF also seeks to end the dependence of needy parents on government benefits by promoting job preparation, work, and marriage. It seeks to prevent and reduce the incidence of out of wedlock pregnancies and encourage the formation and maintenance of two-parent families. And while TANF is primarily thought of as a cash assistance program for low-income families, only around a quarter of TANF dollars spent in federal fiscal year 2016 were used to provide basic cash assistance for families. And because TANF funds are designed to be flexible, they can be used for a wide array of services and supports aimed at achieving one of the program's four goals. And so states use this flexible funding for supporting child welfare activities. There's also the Social Services Block Grant, SSBG, which is a source of flexible funding to promote self-sufficiency, prevent or remedy child maltreatment, reduce inappropriate use of institutional care, and, and more. And SSBG can be used for a wide variety of purposes, with child welfare being one of them. And then Title IV-E of the Social Security Act is another funding source specific to child welfare and can be used for foster care, adoption, guardianship, transition supports for eligible children, and child welfare workforce training. And Title IV-E is the largest federal funding stream for child welfare agencies. <clears throat> and then finally, states may use other federal funding streams to fund child welfare services, such as the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, CAPTA, Adoption and Guardianship Incentive Awards, and more. So with that overview, as you can see on this slide, <clears throat> Title IV-B and Medicaid child welfare agency expenditures decreased quite substantially over the past decade. But on the flip side, expenditures of other federal funding sources experienced increases, like a 5% increase in 4E since 2006. <coughs> So, what's behind these trends? One explanation behind these federal expenditure trends is sequestration. <clears throat> the Budget Control Act of 2011 stipulated automatic spending cuts starting in federal fiscal year 2013 if Congress 
was unable to reduce spending on its own. And so most child welfare funding sources were not affected by sequestration, but two sources, uh, 4B and FSBG, were affected. And the effects of sequestration are likely reflected in, but do not account for all of the 29% reduction in 4B spending over the past decade. However, you know, in shifting to SSBG, we saw that SSBG spending by child welfare agencies increased by 8% since 2006. And so at first glance, this may seem counterintuitive given sequestration, but SSBG is not solely dedicated to child welfare. And in fact, the total state SSBG spending on services most relevant to child welfare agencies has increased in recent years, while spending on services less relevant to child welfare agencies, like services and supports for vulnerable and elderly adults has decreased. So in other words, while the total SSBG allocation provided to states has shrunk due to sequestration, it appears that child welfare agencies are accessing a greater proportion of these allocations than in the past. And there's also decreases in 4B funding for programs that primarily fund child welfare agencies, I should say. And so, and it's, apart from sequestration, appropriations for 4B programs that primarily fund child welfare agencies have decreased over the past decade. 4B is made up of two subparts, and subpart two is called the Promoting Safe and Stable Families Program, or PSSF. And that program primarily funds family support, family preservation, reunification, and adoption promotion and support activities. And out of that total appropriation for the PSSF program, funds must be set aside for certain things. Uh, one being the court improvement program. Uh, another example is regional partnership grants that seek to improve outcomes for children affected by parental substance abuse. Um, there's also a set aside for improvement to caseworker visits and research, evaluation, training, and technical assistance. So after those set-asides are funded, then the remaining PSSS dollars under 4B are available to child welfare agencies for services. And so in federal fiscal years 2006 to 2010, part of the total cost of the court improvement program was funded outside of Title 4B. But then starting in 2011, the full cost began to be covered under the PSSF program. And since court improvement dollars go to courts and not child welfare agencies, this means that over the course of the past decade, fewer 4B dollars were left over for child welfare agencies after the court improvement program set aside. And likewise, the regional partnership grants started in fiscal year 2007. And since many RPG grantees are not child welfare agencies, the addition of the RPG set aside also reduced the amount of PSSF dollars available to child welfare agencies. And then the appropriation for the one PSSF set aside just, uh, that is directed to child welfare agencies, funds to improve caseworker visits, that one actually declined over the decade. So that helps explain why Title IV-B um, uh, uh, expenditures have gone down. There are also changes in how state child welfare agencies use Medicaid. The observed decrease in child welfare agency Medicaid expenditures over the decade may be due to changes in how state child welfare agencies use Medicaid, rather than a decrease in Medicaid services for this population. In fact, between 2006 and 2016, fewer states reported that the child welfare agency accessed Medicaid dollars. So for instance, Child welfare agencies in some states reported that they have shifted costs from Medicaid-funded services to another agency, bundled or unbundled services, and transitioned between fee-for-service and managed care systems. And these are you know, administrative changes that can affect how Medicaid is accessed in each state and could contribute to the observed decrease in child welfare agency Medicaid expenditures. But without surveying how all entities in a state access Medicaid dollars for the child welfare population, it is unclear whether the use of Medicaid for this population is simply shifting between agencies or whether Medicaid-funded Medicaid services are more or less 
available to the child welfare population. However, a, a 2014 analysis conducted by the Congressional Research Service um, that looked at total Medicaid spending on a subpopulation of children involved with the child welfare system showed that total Medicaid spending on this population did not change so, um, significantly between federal fiscal years 2005 and 2010. However, this report did show that total Medicaid spending on this population for rehabilitative services and targeted case management decreased between 2005 and 2010. And these are types of Medicaid services that child welfare agencies tend to use Medicaid for. Therefore, while total Medicaid spending on this population remained relatively stable uh, based on the CRS report, the kinds of services being used changed, which could help explain why child welfare agency Medicaid expenditures went down. And then finally, there have been recent changes to Title IV-E. And as we showed on the prior slide, Title IV-E expenditures increased by 5% over the decade. And this because states are continuing to see the impact of the Fostering Connections Act of 2008, which influenced expenditures in several 4 u programs. Uh, for example, this legislation broadened the adoption assistance eligibility criteria, resulting in an increase in the number of children receiving adoption subsidies and the overall funding level of the adoption assistance program. Uh, likewise, there's been a 45% increase in 4E guardianship assistance uh, program expenditures between 2014 and 2016. This is because more states have taken up the option made available in the legislation that allows for 4E reimbursement of assistance payments made to eligible relative caregivers who opt to pursue legal guardianship. In addition, most states that already had a 4E guardianship assistance program saw that program expand in 2016. In addition, the Fostering Connections Act allowed states to claim additional training costs starting in 2009 and allowed for 4E to be used for the costs for youth ages 18 to 21 to remain in foster care uh, contingent on other requirements. And then beyond fostering connections, the increase in total 4E expenditures was also driven by an 82% increase in Title IV-E waiver expenditures between 2014 and 2016, which we'll talk about a little bit later. All right. Um, so I'm gonna move on to our third key finding, which is that child welfare agency spending continues to be predominantly financed by state and local sources. In addition to federal sources, states spend their own uh, dollars on child welfare services and activities. Uh, state and local funds are used to match federal funds or to meet required maintenance of effort for a federal program and to pay for additional costs that the federal funds do not cover. For most states, these funds come primarily from state dollars, though some states report using more local dollars than state dollars. In 2016, 56% uh, of all dollars spent by child welfare agencies came from state and local as opposed to federal sources. And as you can see here on this graph, uh, during the past decade, these proportions have, uh, you know, have held steady. Uh, key finding number four, and this isn't surprising, is that uh, states vary greatly in terms of child welfare agency expenditures. Uh, the graph here gives you some examples of how states vary in the proportion of funds that come from federal versus state and local sources. And these are, you know, these are just some example states, you know, that we pulled to show variation. Um, and the breakdown for all states is available in our main report. Um, and, you know, as you can see here, Louisiana had the largest proportion of funds from federal sources at 78%. And then Delaware had the smallest proportion um, at 17%. Um, the, and, you know, now we're going to break that previous, the previous slide down a little bit further. Uh, this slide shows the breakdown of all sources uh, for a select few states. Um, so states not only vary in terms of how they use their federal versus state and local dollars, but they also vary regarding their use of, um, of federal sources. So we've identified four different types of uh, funding profiles, and you know we've shown you one example of each here on this slide. Uh, the first one is balanced funding structures. 
in which the Child Welfare Agency uses a mix of federal and state and local funds and draws on a, on a diversified selection of federal funding sources, uh, both those that are dedicated to funding child welfare services as well as others. Uh, the next one is a federal dedicated funding structure in which the Child Welfare Agency uses more federal than state and local funds and draws primarily from um, dedicated but federal funding streams. When I say dedicated, I mean sources that are dedicated specifically to funding child welfare services like Title IV-E and Title IV-B. Uh, the third one is our federal non-dedicated funding structures in which, again, the agency uses more federal than state and local funds, but relies heavily on non-dedicated uh, funding streams. And by non-dedicated, uh, we mean sources that can also be used by a variety of agencies to fund other types of services. So these would be like your Medicaid, TANF, or SSPT. And the last one is a state and local funding structure in which the Child Welfare Agency relies primarily on state and local funds uh, instead of federal sources. So I'm sure a big question that a lot of you have is, well, why do they vary so much? Um, uh, you know, we've identified, um, you know, a few factors, uh, including the ability to meet match requirements. Uh, while most states want to maximize the use of open-ended title entitlement funds, such as 4E, uh, which allow for federal reimbursement without a set ceiling, um, states they you know they have to have sufficient funds to meet the match requirement. So, for example, Title 4E has a 50% match requirement for administrative costs. Therefore, the availability of state and local dollars limits the use of some federal funding sources. For instance, if a state has limited state and local funds, it may prefer to rely more heavily on federal funding streams that do not require it to contribute to state and local matching funds like uh, SSPT. Uh, the characteristics of children served by the Child Welfare Agency can also affect which funding streams are used, and that's due to eligibility criteria associated with certain funding sources. Uh, for example, Title IV-E has an income eligibility requirement uh, that means that only certain children are eligible for 4E reimbursement. For instance, if a state has, you know, only a few eligible children that are eligible for Title IV-E or Medicaid, uh, the Child Welfare Agency is going to be limited in its Title IV-E and Medicaid expenditures. Uh, there's also competition from other agencies, such as TANF agencies, uh, for non-dedicated funding streams. Uh, and this means that some uh, child welfare agencies may find it difficult to access those sources. And this competition can be particularly great in times of economic downturns when pressures on TANF cash assistance are higher and leave fewer dollars available for other purposes. And in those cases, a child welfare agency may rely more heavily on, fun on funding streams that are dedicated to child welfare purposes than other more broader uh, funding sources. And the last factor uh, we identified um, are federal funding stream requirements. Some federal funding streams have requirements such as eligibility determinations that can place a high administrative burden on states, which can be costly and can outweigh the benefit of receiving the funding. And this could cause some states to rely more heavily um, on state and local funds. And, uh, you know, like I said, we showed you one example um, of each one of these funding structures. Um, here, but in the appendices of our report, um, you can find um, this uh, funding breakdown um, for every state. Great. So key finding number five is that Title IV-E waiver expenditures increased since 2014. Um, before we dig into this, first a little bit of background about waivers. Um, the federal government can waive state compliance with specific Title IV-E eligibility requirements for states participating in what are called waiver projects. And for example, for a child to be eligible for the Title IV-E foster care program, they must meet eligibility criteria related to things like income, circumstances around their entry into care, and the type of placement that they're in. And there are also requirements around the types of services and supports that can be reimbursed by 4E. And if a state has a 4E waiver, the federal government can waive 
those specific 4E requirements. And the state can use 4E funds to cover services for children who are not traditionally eligible under 4E and pay for services that aren't typically 4E reimbursable. So the waiver projects are designed to promote innovation in the design and delivery of child welfare services to support child safety, permanency, and well-being. And while states vary in terms of the goals of their waiver projects, many focus on uh, preventing abuse or neglect, or reducing the occurrence of reentry into foster care, and supporting permanency. And so of the total $29.9 billion in reported child welfare agency expenditures for 2016, about $2 billion of that is associated with federal 4E waiver-related expenditures. And between 2014 and 2016, those waiver expenditures have increased by 82%, like I mentioned a couple of minutes ago. And this increase was due to more states reporting waiver expenditures in 2016. Um, specifically, 18 states reported waiver expenditures in 2014 compared to 27 states in 2016. But this increase is also due to increases in waiver expenditures among states that had a waiver in both years. So, for instance, New York's waiver spending increased by almost 600%. And in fact, the majority, around you know, three quarters or so, of the increase in waiver spending was due to existing waiver states expending more waiver dollars. And funds accessed through a waiver can be used to cover four different types of expenditures. One are costs that would have been reimbursed without the waiver. Um, these are the costs for those 4E eligible children to receive 4E eligible activities. There's also costs for 4E eligible activities for children who would not qualify for 4E under traditional, traditional eligibility criteria. And then third, there's costs for activities that fall completely outside of traditional 4E eligible categories for any child, regardless of their eligibility. And then finally, there are project development and evaluation costs that are mandated by participation in the waiver. And states reported that in 2016, 10% of waiver funds were used for services and activities not previously reimbursable under 4E. And states reported paying for activities like in-home services or, or prevention services and evidence-based practices. And the remaining 89% of the waiver funds were spent on activities like maintenance payments and caseworker activities on behalf of children in care that would have been permitted without the waiver. However, states spent 16% of total waiver expenditures on activities for children who without the waiver would not have been eligible for 4E due to income, placement type, or, or their circumstances um, related to their entry into care. So with the waivers currently set to expire later this year, states will have to find other funds to cover those services and activities. And if 2016 expenditures are indicative of waiver spending in more recent years, then the end of the waivers would result in a loss of more than $300 million in Title IV-E funds, which is calculated as 26% of the total waiver expenditures reported by these 24 states that could break out their waiver spending. Um, a few things to keep in mind is that states with waivers must still provide traditionally eligible services like foster care. So they're limited in how much of their waiver dollars can go to new innovative services. And also, while not asked on the Child Welfare Financing Survey, states could be using non-4E funds to help finance their waiver interventions. And also, the federal 4E waiver picture does not capture the possible benefits to the state child welfare financing system overall. Uh, for example, even in states that are using a waiver to fund only 4E eligible activities for non-4E eligible children, other dollars that would have gone to cover those costs are presumably freed up and might be used in other innovative ways. Uh, it's also important to note that among the 27 states that reported waiver expenditures in 2016, California, Maine, and Nebraska were not able to detail how they spent their waiver dollars. Uh, and since California is such a large state, the omission of its data may skew results, and so we recommend exercising caution when interpreting these results. Uh, we were also curious about whether how states spent their waiver dollars changed between 2014 and 2016. 
And so among the states that reported waiver expenditures in those two years, the percentage of waiver expenditures that would have been reimbursed without the waiver increased a little bit, and the percentage of waiver expenditures spent on costs for 4E eligible activities for non-4E eligible children decreased slightly. In this, this analysis that's shown on the slide here groups all waiver states together, but it's possible that the use of waiver dollars varies by when the state first started its waiver. And in fact, when we separated out the waiver states into three groups, those that had a waiver the longest spent a smaller proportion of waiver expenditures on costs that would have been reimbursed without the waiver in that first category here. And the states that had a waiver the longest spent a greater proportion on costs for non-4E eligible services and activities in the third category. Uh, and this difference may be a result of waiver states using their waiver interventions to reduce the number of children in care, which over time could reduce spending on traditionally eligible 4E activities and increase spending on non-eligible activities. Right. Uh, so finding, key finding number six, about half of federal and state and local expenditures by child welfare agencies involve out-of-home placements, while small, with smaller proportions spent on other services. And as you can see on this graph here, uh, adoption and legal guardianship and home preventive services and child protective services each made up about, you know, between 15 to 18 percent of total expenditures. And then a small percentage was used for services and assistance for older youth. And this slide shows the breakdown um, for federal and state and local funds um, combined. But if we were to break this out of, so, you know, federal funds versus um, the state and local funds, um, you'd see, you know, you would see a similar pattern. So states also reported the amount of federal and state and local funds that their child welfare agency expended on relative or non-relative family foster care and congregate care. So by family foster care, we mean family-based placements like traditional or therapeutic foster family homes or relative foster care placements, for example. Um, but then by congregate care settings, we mean group homes, residential treatment centers, shelters, etc. And state and local sources finance slightly more than half of spending on both family foster care and congregate care. So as you can see here, 57% of spending on family foster care came from state and local sources, while 64% of spending on congregate care came from state and local sources. Then when we're examining only federal spending on family foster care and congregate care, we see that 40% of federal spending on these placement settings was spent on congregate care. And then when examining only state and local spending on these placement settings, 48% of state and local spending on these placement settings is spent on congregate care. And so this information about spending on out-of-home placement settings shows us that congregate care is disproportionately expensive. I mean, that's not shocking to anyone. I think that's uh, well documented, but this helps put some, some numbers to that, um, to that understanding. As you can see here in this orange box here, uh, congregate care accounts for a little less than half of spending on out-of-home placements, but only 12% of the children in care were in congregate care settings in fiscal year 2016, which helps us understand just how disproportionate the cost is. Okay, so key finding number eight is that fewer child welfare agencies focus prevention spending on substance use and mental health services than other preventive services. This year we began asking states about their spending on different categories of prevention services. So this is one of the new questions that Christina you know, mentioned at the beginning. Um, you know, states ranked the top three categories of preventive services for which their child welfare agencies spent federal and state and local funds. And the figure here shows the number of states that ranked each preventive service in their top three. So the top services in 2016 were parent skill-based programs, uh, caseworker visits and administration, which included uh, information and referral services, and, uh, and financial support, such as assistance with transportation, housing, childcare, and more. And there are a relatively small number of states in which the child welfare agency focuses its prevention spending on substance abuse and mental health services. 
And this finding is important uh, given the need for these services among families involved in the child welfare system, as well as the ongoing opioid crisis that's striking many child welfare systems across the country. Um, it's also important to note that while child welfare agencies may not be focusing their prevention spending on these programs, it's possible that the child welfare agencies in those states partner with other agencies, such as health departments, um, to fund such services. So this is not meant to mean that those services are not being provided. Uh, they are just not being funded by um, child welfare. Right, and our last key finding is uh, related to spending on evidence-based practices and transportation for school stability. Uh, on this year's survey, we asked questions about, about these topics, and they were, they were new questions this year, uh, but only a small number of states responded to these questions, so we're unable to report national results. And our assessment is that state data systems are simply not set up in a way to, that allow for the collection of these data in a straightforward manner. So for instance, costs for transportation to maintain school stability may be bundled with other costs, like a foster care maintenance payment if foster parents are the ones providing the transportation. And that makes isolating transportation costs difficult. And so while we can't produce national findings related to spending on EBPs and transportation for school stability, the fact that so many states struggle to report this information is significant in itself. And in particular, states' inability to produce data on spending on evidence-based practices will be of increasing importance as states begin implementing the Family First Prevention Services Act, since that law requires states to track spending on EBPs and promising practices in certain circumstances. All right, so those are uh, that's our discussion of the key findings. And before we go on to um, answering questions, um, I'm just going to give I'm going to uh, give you a preview of the additional products that we have on our website. So um, while I'm doing that, if you have questions, please uh, enter them into the chat box or the questions box, um, and uh, and we'll uh, answer those um, momentarily. Um, so um, all of these uh, products that I'm going to give you a preview of are available on the Child Trends website. Um, I have the um, link here, but if you Google Child Trends Struggle for Financing, um, the report will come up. Um, so first off is the, uh, is the full report, which includes an executive summary, a detailed presentation of the findings, um, a discussion and appendices with state level data. Um, so when someone had uh, asked the question of whether or not we have state level expenditures available, and we do, um, they're available um, both in the report and in another resource that I'm gonna highlight in a moment. Um, for those of you who are data nerds like me, um, we also have uh, an easy to use state level data table in Excel uh, that, can, that you can download and play around with. Um, so both of those are available on our website. And then if you're interested in learning more about a specific funding source, you can take a look at our funding source um, fact sheets or resources. Uh, each one breaks uh, one of the major funding sources down a little further than in the main report. Um, and they're great for those of you who are new to child welfare financing to get a better um, understanding of each of the um, federal, uh, each of the major funding sources. Um, but these resources have more graphics um, and that kind of thing. Um, and then finally, uh, if you want to know more about funding in a particular state, in addition to the information in the appendices, um, we have some state level resources as well. Um, and, uh, you know, these resources provide all of the available information for each state in one place, um, whereas uh, the appendices in the data table, um, you know, those are good for making um, comparisons amongst, um, you know, different states. But um, if you're really wanting to focus in on one state, these are great because it has all of the information about that state in one place. Um, so now we are going to stop for questions, and I'll just say we may not be able to answer all of your questions, um, but we'll try and follow up with you if we don't get to your question. Uh, and since there are so many of you on the uh, on the webinar, um, instead of unmuting folks, we're going to read questions um, from the question box mm -hmm. um, and then answer them. Yep. So. so we've had a couple come in so far, and feel free to type in your questions in the question box. Um, our first question. And comment is from Carolee Morano. Uh, 
Carolee uh, made a comment around how there has been a shift. Uh, she's seen a, a shift in her organization where there's been fewer referrals to congregate care replacements and with a priority meet being more focused on um, family-based settings and family preservation, you know, prevention services, that sort of thing. And she asked if the 5% increase in child welfare expenditures is related to that shift in priorities. Um, that's a good question. And of course, you know, the, uh, like we shared earlier, that the reasons behind these trends are, are complex. Um, and a you know, piece of it could be the shifting priority um, more towards family-based settings, more to like upstream services. Um, that would, you know, in my mind, drive expenditures down. Uh, I wouldn't drive expenditures up per se, but again, the story is complex. And if um, you know more families are being served, even though you know, fewer children are going to congregate care placements, that could um, that could contribute to increases in expenditures. Um, and Carolee also had later in her comment. Um, a, a, a note around how, you know, the slide around showing congregate care and how it's disproportionately expensive. She noted that, you know, it's one thing to say that it's, it's costly, but do we know if there's a benefit in terms of the outcomes that justifies mm -hmm. the cost? And if, are those sorts of things being looked at? Um, I think that's a really good point. Um, that's not something that our survey looks at. We're, we're just focused on um, the expenditures and what the money is being spent on. Uh, but that's an important consideration to keep in mind. It's not all about, you know, doing things more cheaply. Um, you have to keep in mind, uh, you know, what's best for that child and, and family, too. So that was Carolee's comment. Um, I'm going to pass this one to Sarah Kass, and I'll ask this question of you from William Thorne. Um, do you have resources or information on tribes? Um, we do not have information um, or resources on tribes. Um, we uh, the survey uh, is sent to uh, you know, state child welfare agencies. Um, uh, the, it's outside of our current scope um, to look at um, tribes uh, and their specific expenditures. Um, but that's something that you know we always have um, you know in the back of our minds um, were uh, you know additional resources to become available. Uh, so I just want to put out the call again for folks to add their questions to the question box. Uh, we, we got a comment from, from someone else uh, mentioning that um, you know, waivers are um, designed to be cost neutral over the term of the waiver. Uh, thank you, Charlie Ferguson, Ferguson for, for noting that. Um, but do any other folks have questions or comments that they would like to make? And if so, you can use this time to enter the, uh, the question into the question box. We'll give folks a, a minute or so to kind of think up of their question and, and type it in. Looks like Carolee uh, may be in the process of submitting um, a follow-up question, so we'll, we'll give her a moment. Carolee's follow-up question around the um, shift away from congregate care and prioritizing more family-based settings, uh, she indicated that um, there is concern that, that that shift may have an unintended consequence of shifting the burden of services and costs from the child welfare system to the runaway and homeless youth system of care. And there's also a concern that there may be an unintended consequence of shifting the burden of services and costs um, to that that service that system of care, and she asked if that's being looked at. Um, and so again, another great point around kind of the the big picture of you know how this population is being served. Our survey is just focused on child welfare agency expenditures. Mm -hmm. um, we we don't look at say you know for example, there's a lot of interest in the education system and health system and and their spending on this population. Um, likewise, you know, runaway and homeless youth uh, system of care as well. You know, there are lots of agencies and entities that 
provide services to, to this population while they're in foster care and then later in life as well. Um, but our survey is just focused on child welfare agency spending. So unfortunately, no, we don't <laughs> we don't have um, a sense of any kind of shifting costs that may be going on. Um, yeah, and so um, Aubrey Edwards asked um, if this level of, anal of analysis is available by state on the website, um, and it is in the uh, the appendices of the main report um has you know pretty much for i believe it's for every well almost every question asked we you know give each uh, state's response um in the um in the appendices including you know percent change from one year to the next um so if you're interested in the um, state level data um you can take a look at the uh the appendices in the final report um as well as the um state level resources um there's one for every state and if there's anything that you can't find that you really are interested in, um, just you can email us, and we'd be more than happy to yeah. provide you what we may have. There is a lot in the appendices, so if you're <laughs> having a hard time finding it, you can always shoot us an email. Uh, so Jennifer has a question about whether we have any thoughts on the funding impact of the Family First Prevention Services Act for waiver states. So that's a very timely question. Um, and so, you know, as I mentioned in the, the waiver part of the conversation, that with the end of the waivers, it's expected that the waiver states may lose more than $300 million in federal 4E funds. But of course, and if the states implement the Family First Prevention Services Act um, in its entirety, that could help you know, mitigate and help with that transition a bit, because a lot of the waiver interventions that states are implementing are uh, prevention services that could be eligible under the Family First Act. And so um, that transition to Family First um, can, may make up for kind of some or all of what the states may lose under the waiver. So we've answered all questions submitted so far. If you have any other questions, feel free to submit them now. We'll pause for a moment to give you a chance to type them in. All right, so we're we're not seeing any other questions. Oh, wait, I spoke uh, <laughs> one millisecond too soon. Um, so Andrew Kim, he submitted a question saying, I'm sorry I missed the part about the substantial decrease to Title IV-B in Medicaid. Could you briefly explain why? Um, yes, I'll try to briefly explain why. <laughs> That's the challenging part um, because it is quite complex. But in kind of a broad brush, kind of nutshell, uh, the, the trend in 4B has gone down because of one, sequestration. Um, sequestration affected 4B part two a bit. It wouldn't account for the full 29% decrease in 4B. Um, but the, the larger piece of the story around 4B is kind of how it's set up. Um, Title 4B subpart two is set up in a way where there's a, a set amount of funds and before uh, funds are made available to child welfare agencies for services. There are particular programs that are funded through set aside. So of the total amount, there's uh, some funds that are set aside for the court improvement program, for regional partnership grants, and, and some other things as well. And after those set asides are taken into account, then what's left over is available to child welfare agencies for services. And what we've seen is that over the past decade, some of those uh, set aside, the amount of those set asides has increased. And so as those set asides increase, the amount left over for child welfare agencies goes down. Um, so that's the kind of the big picture story around 4B. Um, as for Medicaid, which saw a 46% decrease over the past decade, um, and again, specifically, you know, child welfare agency spending of Medicaid. Um, the story there is around you know, shifts in how child welfare agencies use Medicaid. So, for example, we've seen that over the decade, fewer 
child welfare agencies report it that they they use any Medicaid dollars at all. Um, and there's also been shifts in like sort of administrative of administrative nature with Medicaid, where um, child welfare agencies are shifting Medicaid funded services to another agency or transitioning from um, fee for service to managed care systems or bundling or unbundling Medicaid services. And those sorts of things can impact how um, you know, Medicaid is accessed and which agency is responsible for, for paying uh, for uh, Medicaid uh, costs. So that's sort of the summary of um, 4B and Medicaid and why those have decreased. Uh, Charlie Ferguson has asked a question around, um, can you clarify your statement about waiver jurisdictions losing funds and the source of the dollar amount you provided? I would be happy to, Charlie. So I'm going to actually go back in the slides. Sorry for the whirlwind. This will be a good uh, refresher in case anyone has any questions because um, the slide is helpful in illustrating this. And so. Uh, the way we came up with that $300 million estimate is that we asked states how they have waivers, how do they use their waiver? And the first category here, costs that would have been reimbursed without the waiver, you know, 73%, you know, there's, even after the waiver, they would still get 40 for that. Um, it's those other categories, the costs for 40 eligible activities for non-eligible children and costs for non 40 eligible services and activities that 26%, those two categories combined, we take that 26% of the total waiver expenditures reported to us by the 24 states that were able to report this breakout. And so that 26% of the total of these 24 states is that 300 million. Um, one caveat that I mentioned before, but it's worth reiterating here, is that California is not included here. Um, also Maine and Nebraska, but California is, the, is a very large state. Um, and so when we cite that $300 million estimate, that's a sort of lowball estimate because if California were included, that would increase quite a bit. So um, we basically just use that as a way of illustrating you know, how the end of the waiver may impact states. And our, um, our calculation here is that the end of the waiver would result in a loss of more than $300 million in 4E funds. Um, but like I was mentioning earlier, the family the implementation of Family First will help mitigate some or all of that. So I'll go back to the final slide. Any other final questions? All right, I'm not seeing any others come in. So if you have any questions that come up after we conclude, our email addresses and phone numbers are up on the screen here. Uh, we will be posting these slides on our website uh, after today's webinar. And like I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we try we tried to record. We hope it recorded. Uh, we did have some technical difficulties, so we apologize if the recording doesn't go through. But if it was successful, that will be posted on our website alongside these slides as well. So thank you everyone for joining. I hope this was useful and informative. And again, feel free to reach out to us with any follow-up questions or, or comments that you may have. Have a great afternoon, everyone.